Hey everyone, welcome back again for another edition of uh, the Photo Hour, that's what we call it. <laughs> uh, good to have you back. Uh, today is the last one for our first week running this program, so I hope you've enjoyed it so far. But we do plan to continue things for next week. Um, I haven't decided 100% what the topics will be, but uh, I know we're going to be talking about manual exposure first up on Wednesday. And so before we get to manual exposure, we've got one more thing really to talk about, which is shutter speed. And we're going to be covering shutter speed in a fair bit of detail today, both in the technical and creative aspects of it. Uh, before I get into things though, I do want to sort of welcome everyone and remind you that the shop is open. Uh, if you do have a question or need to look at something, you can go into the store, though we do encourage you to, to shop online if you can. Uh, the store is open from 11 till 4. We're also available on the phone as well if you'd like to give us a call. The phone number is 9672-2222. Okay, so let's get into things for today and start talking about shutter speed. Uh, we talked about aperture first up, shutter speed today, ISO is the only one left before we get to manual exposure. Uh, but ISO we don't need to worry about so much. It's really aperture and shutter speed which are the two most important things to be able to control. And the reason they're important to control is because they're the biggest uh, influences over the outcome of our photo, the creative outcome. Uh, and we want to be able to control things for creativity. That's the whole reason we take photos for. Uh, and if we can't control things creatively, then we're really at the mercy of what the camera is going to give us. So let's start by having a little bit of a chat about what shutter speed is. Well, uh, inside your camera, there is a curtain in front of the sensor that opens and closes. Uh, in fact, there's actually two curtains. There's one that opens and another one that follows it. And the time that that curtain stays open for is referred to as the shutter speed. Uh, this is one of the ways that we physically control the light that's coming into the camera. So the first way was through the aperture, through that hole in the lens. The second way is with the shutter speed. Uh, so what does the shutter speed do? Uh, well, one, it controls light in some way, and we'll talk a little bit about that and how specific numbers work. Uh, the other thing that shutter speed does is that it controls motion and whether we blur or we freeze motion. And that's the more exciting part of it. That's the creative part. Uh, so we'll be talking a lot today about how you either blur or freeze motion, sometimes doing both at once, and the different sort of looks that will give you. Uh, but depending on what your subject is and depending on how quickly the subject is moving, then we're gonna need different shutter speeds. There's not really a one size fits all. Uh, a lot of it just comes through practice and, and getting a feel for how different things move. Uh, like normal, if you've got any questions, feel free to ask them in the comments. Uh, I'll have a look at the end and, and answer to you. Uh, so yeah, don't feel free to, to yell out if I haven't explained anything as fully as you'd like, or if there's something else that I haven't really touched on. Okay, uh, so it controls motion, uh, it controls light in some manner as well. Uh, it also controls the sharpness of our image in some ways too, and that comes back to how we freeze motion. Uh, there's two types of motion you need to think about when you're thinking about shutter speed. The first one is your subject's motion, so how quickly the thing is that you're photographing is moving, and the second one is your own motion, particularly if you're hand holding the camera. Because if you're holding onto the camera, any slight movements made by your body can cause blurriness in the photo as well. Uh, so there are two things to sort of think about, both our motion and both the subject's motion, and we need to make sure that we're choosing a shutter speed that's going to render our image successfully for both of those two things. Um, let's have a look at some numbers to start with, and then we'll have a look at some visual examples as to what's happening uh, behind these numbers. I'm going to jump over to my screen now here so we can pull up one of the slides from um, one of my classes, the Understanding New Camera class. This is the one I want. And we'll just pull that up a little bit bigger. Okay, uh, so let's have a look at some of these numbers here. Uh, what we've got is we've got fractions of a second. So a thousandth of a second, a five hundredth of a second, all the way up to a half a second in this particular graphic here. Uh, this is by no means an exhaustive list of the numbers that you'll have in your actual camera. Uh, so many cameras will go faster than this, go up to about a four thousandth of a second or an eight thousandth of a second. Uh, and every camera will go slower than this as well till we're actually getting to full seconds. Uh, some cameras will go up to 30 seconds, two minutes, some even go up to five minutes. 
minutes or longer. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk about these numbers first and then we'll have a look at some examples of photos as to what they're actually doing. Uh, but what you can see here is that as the number gets quicker, we're freezing our subject and as it gets slower, we're starting to blur our subject. All right, uh, and sometimes we want things to be blurry. We'll see reasons why in a little bit. Uh, the other thing I want to point out with these numbers though, is that every time we, we uh, halve a number, so uh, halving would actually be going this way, uh, 60th of a second to 125th of a second, we're letting in half as much light. If we double a number, so 60th of a second to a 30th of a second, we're letting in twice as much light. We don't need to worry about this too much at this stage. We're going to focus more on the creative side of things. But once we get to manual exposure, when this, this sort of relationship between halving and doubling light, we'll need to take a little bit more notice of. Because when we halve the light in one section, it normally means we need to double the light something else in somewhere else in order to maintain balance. All right, I'm going to jump out of here for a tick. Come back over my screen. There's just another thing I want to point out with the numbers here. And I've already drawn this up on my whiteboard. So I'll hold that up for you. Uh, way that most cameras show shutter speed is they don't actually show you a fraction like I had in that graph there. They actually just show you a number. Uh, this varies slightly from camera model to camera model. So you may actually have fractions on your particular camera. But historically, a number four would actually mean a quarter of a second or a number eight, an eighth of a second, and you get the idea. Now, the way that we know we're in full seconds, seconds is by seeing this little quotation mark here. So anytime you see a number with a quotation mark next to it, that means you're in full seconds. Just reiterating that, number four by itself, quarter of a second, four quotation mark, four seconds. Uh, there will be a point on your camera where you swap from fractions of a second to full seconds. Uh, it's good to sort of find out where that little point is. Uh, and we're going to talk about how to change the shutter speed right now. Uh, there are a couple of different ways to change it. One way is using full manual exposure. But what we're going to use today is shutter priority. Uh, like aperture priority, our shutter priority lets us to control the shutter speed and the camera works out the aperture and the ISO for us in the background. So we don't need to worry about the exposure side of things. All we're doing is choosing shutter speed based on some sort of creative look we're wanting to get from the photo. So uh, like with aperture priority, shutter priority is found in the same place on your camera. And on this particular camera here, I've got a mode dial at the top with a bunch of different letters on it. And if I swap that to the letter S, then I'm in shutter priority. Now, if you're using uh, Canon, you're actually looking for TV. Uh, TV stands for time value. That's what Canon use as their shutter priority. If you've got a Fuji camera, then what you'd be doing is swapping your shutter speed dial out of automatic. So you're choosing the number yourself and putting everything else back in auto. So see if you can find on your camera where shutter priority is. And once you've turned your camera into shutter priority, what we need to do then is work out how to actually change the shutter speed. Uh, this is very similar to aperture priority as well. On your camera, you'll likely have some control wheels and you spin them around and they'll change different things for you. Uh, so on my camera here, if I spin my back control wheel, which is just up where my thumb sits, then I'm changing the shutter speed, all right? Uh, some cameras, it might be the wheel on the back next to the LCD screen. Some cameras, it might be the wheel near the shutter button. Uh, if you've got a touch screen, then maybe you'll just be able to touch different places to get different shutter speeds. Uh, but see if you can find one, how to turn your camera into shutter priority mode, and two, how to actually change the shutter speed. And just give that a bit of a spin around, uh, have a look at some different numbers. Uh, you'll be able to see a whole bunch there. There'll be a huge range of them. But see if you can find the point where you go from fractions of a second to full second, because that's an important one to know. Uh, we'll be talking a lot about full seconds, particularly when we talk about landscape photography, because that allows us to get a certain sort of effect. All right, let's jump back over to my display now, and we'll have a look at some pictures here. Uh, so you might remember Moosey the other day, uh, we used him for the focusing exercise and I've used him again just to have a bit of a visual demonstration as to what's happening with shutter speed here too. So all I did for this photo was I dropped Moosey in front of the camera and I took a photo each time he fell at different shutter speeds. Uh, let's have a run through the numbers. A photograph on the left hand side shot at a 30th of a second. As you can see there's quite a bit of blur there. Uh, photograph at 125th as a second next 
we're actually starting to freeze a bit of the form but still quite blurry. Uh, photograph at a 500th of a second, uh, we can see the form quite defined now but we've still got blur even at a 500th of a second. It's actually not till we get to a 4,000th of a second that we can freeze the moose falling down. So that's a very, very quick shutter speed. Uh, and it's good to sort of play around with these little exercises at home if you can because it will give you a feel for how shutter speed works. Uh, and depending on how quickly our subject is moving, uh, we'll need different shutter speeds to either freeze or blur them. Uh, if the moose was sitting still, then we could shoot at a 30th of a second and it would be sharp. We could shoot at 30 seconds and it would still be sharp. So it's, I just can't reiterate that enough. The sh relationship of shutter speed always comes back to the speed of your subject and also whether you're trying to freeze or get blur. All right, let's have a look at some more photos because that's always the more interesting thing. So the way I've broken it up today is through landscape and wildlife photography, which are really just sort of slow moving subjects or quickly moving subjects. Uh, and I've got some examples of a slow landscape, quick landscape, a quick wildlife, a slow wildlife, uh, just to sort of show you what sort of shutter speeds I've been using to take photos for certain effects. Uh, but there's a lot of latitude and range between all these. Don't think of anything really that I show you as gospel as the perfect example for, for every topic that we talk about. Uh, let's start with a quick landscape. So this is a photo here taken on Angari, uh, sunrise one morning, and this was shot at an eighth of a second. Now, at an eighth of a second with the motion of the waves here, uh, we can actually see some quite defined texture in this water. And there's quite defined texture in the clouds as well. Uh, I consider anything between sort of like a 50th of a second to about one second to be a quick landscape photograph. Uh, generally, our cameras are on tripods when we're shooting landscape photography. So we don't really need to worry about our motion as the photographer. All we're really worrying about is our subject's motion instead. I'm going to flick across to the next photo here. So this was shot up in Queensland, and this is using a 30 second exposure. So just have a look at the difference uh, between the water in those two shots. We can see a lot of texture in this one on the right hand side in an eighth of a second, but all that texture starts to blur out in that photo on the left hand side. Uh, we are still getting a little bit of detail though. So we've still got some highlights and some shadows in the water here caused by the foam of the waves. It hasn't blurred out completely. Now, if we step this up a notch and go to 300 seconds instead, uh, what we can see now is there is no texture whatsoever in that water. Uh, so the water's just become a, a complete blurry mist. Uh, the rocks are still sharp because the rocks haven't moved and my camera's on a tripod, so it hasn't moved either. Uh, but we're getting a very different effect. I'm just going to pull those photos up together and um, let me do them in order one, two, three. So you can see the difference in the texture there. Lots of texture, lots of detail in the water, um, less texture and then no texture whatsoever. Okay, uh, and this is all in relation to landscape photography, but it would be anything really that's, um, that's staying still. Um, if you were just photographing rocks and you didn't have something like the waves or the clouds in the photo that could potentially move, then it really wouldn't matter what shutter speed you shot at. It could be, could be two hours and it would still be sharp as long as you didn't move the camera. All right, let's have a look at a quick subject now. Um, so I've got some photos of quick wildlife and slow wildlife, though I'll talk a little bit more extensively about that in a second. Now, what I call slow wildlife is wildlife that's not really moving. So uh, we've got an example here of a bird on a branch on the left-hand side and some lemurs. This was shot at one of our zoo walks on the right-hand side, cuddling on the ground. They're not moving too quickly either. Um, so it's what's how are we looking at here? Uh, the subjects aren't moving very quickly. They are moving around a little bit. So, you know, they're, they're not sitting in one particular pose. They're tilting their head left and right a little bit, uh, moving up and down, uh, but they're staying relatively still. And if we have a look at the shutter speeds, let's have a look at the bird one first. Shot at a 320th of a second uh, and the lemur one at a 500th of a second. So what that shutter speed is, is it's quick enough to compensate for my motion. 
Uh, when I took these photos, I was using big, heavy lenses. The bigger the lens, the heavier the lens, and the more zoomed in it is, the more pronounced any shake that I'm making as a photographer will be. So I've used a quick enough shutter speed to uh, render my motion sharply, but I've also used a quick enough shutter speed to freeze these slow moving animals uh, in the, their place. Now, if we go to some quick moving animals instead, uh, we've got a tiger here also shot at the zoo. This tiger was walking towards us at quite a fast pace when I took this shot and then a bird in flight, which is another quite quick subject. Uh, but in these instances, what I've shot them at is what I've got the tiger at a thousandth of a second and the bird at uh, 12, uh, a thousand, geez, can't speak, uh, 1,250th of a second. So quite a bit quicker than what we were doing with those previous shots. And because these animals were needing moving quickly, I needed to quicken up my shutter speed in order to freeze them in motion. Now, a couple of things I want to point out. Uh, with wildlife photography, you, you really are better shooting at quick shutter speeds like this, so a thousandth of a second, uh, fifteen hundredth of a second, something like that, um, than at a five hundredth of a second. Uh, just because you, you always want a bit of a safety net. Uh, if the lemurs really started moving quickly in this shot, then I might have blurred their motion because I was shooting at such a slow shutter speed. Uh, it's always better to err on the side of quicker than the side of slower. Uh, another thing I want to point out too um, is in maybe pull, compare this photo between the bird and uh, and the moose falling here. Uh, so this photo on the left hand side shot at a twelve. I can't say that number. One thousand two hundred and fiftieth of a second um, is sharp. It's tack sharp. And the photo of the moose falling, we needed to go up to a four thousandth of a second in order to get that sharp. So why is there such a difference? Because I can tell you right now, this bird would have been moving quicker than the moose. The reason why the bird is still sharp at a slower shutter speed is because when I was photographing the bird, my camera was moving with it. Uh, so I was moving with the motion of the bird, which lets you shoot at a slower shutter speed. In this photograph on the right hand side, the camera was static. It wasn't moving with the motion of the subject, which is why the shutter speed needed to be so quick in order to render it fast. Uh, render it sharply. Uh, now we'll see in a little bit how moving with the subject creates a certain effect uh, which is called panning and we can use that to blur the background out while keeping our subject nice and sharp. Just want to show you one more example here um, and this might answer your question there Mel I can see about the, the shutter speed of the three landscape picks but let me know if it doesn't. Uh, this is maybe a little bit clearer because it's the same subject shot at two different shutter speeds. Uh, we've got a photo on the left hand side, this was shot at one second, and a photo on the right hand side shot at a tenth of a second. And you can see what a difference that makes in how the water is rendered in those two shots. So the photo on the left hand side, we're getting quite a bit of blur. Uh, this water's moving quite vigorously in this sort of rock pool area. Uh, and what's that doing is it, it's blurring out all this sort of water here, but we've still got quite a little bit of texture in that blur. On the right hand side, the photo is quick enough in order to freeze this wave at the top. This photo was taken at the pinnacle of the wave when the wave was moving at its slowest point. Uh, and we can see we've frozen mostly uh, the water and the foam down the bottom here. Now, uh, which is the better photo? You know, that's not really one for me to answer. Uh, I prefer the photo on the left. And the reason that I prefer it is because by blurring out the texture of this water, I, I get this nice line going from the right hand corner here out to this sort of rocky outcrop. However, if you were more interested in the wave, then this would be the better photo because this is actually uh, freezing this motion. Uh, really, it's a subjective question. It's a subjective choice. I'm not going to tell you which pro photo you should prefer, but what I'm trying to get across is that we're choosing these things based on the look that we're wanting. This isn't just happening by chance. This is happening because of choice. All right. So let's go back to uh, what do I want to talk about next. Uh, let's talk through a couple more exercises. Now, this is going to be a relatively short class today. I, I don't have too much more to talk about. Uh, so again, if you've got any comments or any questions, make sure you leave them in the question section there. Um, I'll, I'll keep an eye out for you, Mel. If I haven't fully explained the shutter speeds, I'll pull them back up at the end as well. But just give me a holler in the, the comments section. 
let's talk about a couple of sort of effects we can get with our shutter speed. Uh, the first one is light trails, which you might have seen this before. Uh, if you've seen photographs of highways and things like that. And that's when we get uh, the brake lights or the headlights of cars burned into the image. Uh, it's the same sort of principle as when we're shooting landscape photography and we're getting this blur in the water. Uh, we've got our camera on a tripod, so the camera's not moving. We've got something in the scene which is static as well. So in this case here, I've got the Arc de Triomphe in this photo, uh, but it's taken at 13 seconds. Uh, so these, the traffic which has been moving has become blurred down the bottom. Now the reason why I've got cars still in this shot is the traffic was stopping and starting. So when the car stopped, the form of the car got burned into the frame. And when the cars moved, we got these sort of streaks down the bottom. Now, this is by no means a, a technically perfect photograph. This was taken many, many eons ago. Uh, probably this photo is probably 10 years uh, old by now, maybe even older. Um, but uh, you can get the sort of idea to, to this sort of effect here. Um, this is the same with light painting as well. If anyone's heard of light painting where you get some sparklers or something like that and you know you sort of you put your camera on a tripod, set it up to a 30 second long exposure and then wave the sparklers around or swing some torches around. Similar sort of principle to, to light, um, light trails where the, the motion of the, the lights will get burned into the image and all the environment around you will stay sharp because the camera is kept on a tripod. Uh, let's have a look at another technique which is really fun one of my favorite techniques and this is panning uh, so this is when we shoot a fast moving subject at a relatively slow shutter speed so i've got a fast moving car here shot at a 40th of a second uh, how does the car stay sharp though well the car stays sharp because we're tracking the motion of the car by moving the camera at the same speed that the car does and by doing that, we freeze the car, the car stays nice and sharp, but the background goes blurry. Uh, the easiest way to do this is using shutter priority and just flicking your shutter speed to different, different speeds. Uh, the quicker the shutter speed, the easier it is to track the subject, but the less blurry the background is. The slower the shutter speed, the, speed, the harder the subject is to, to keep sharp, but the blurrier the background will be. Uh, this takes a little bit of practice, so don't feel like you're necessarily going to get it on the first go. The way that I set up my camera is that I use a single focus point. If you can remember from our focusing discussion yesterday, uh, I use continuous autofocus as well, so that my focus is continuously updating while that subject's moving in front of me. What you want to do is you want to start tracking the car I'll keep referring to a car, but it could be anything. It could be an animal, it could be someone running, uh, anything with movement. Uh, but you start tracking and focusing on the car early because you want to sort of get a feel for how quickly that car's going. Uh, the best place to do something like this is on a, a main road where there's a good stretch uh, so that you know the car is going to be sort of sitting at 60 k's an hour or whatever along that entire sort of stretch of road. Uh, if you've got sets of lights coming up, then the car might be braking and then it makes it a little bit harder to judge its speed. But what I'll do is I'll point my camera at the car and I'll get focus on the car and I'll keep focusing and I'll wait and I'll wait and I'll wait and I'll wait and I'll wait. And then when the car's in front of me, I'll click down and start taking the photo. But you don't want to stop moving while you're taking that photo. It's like a tennis swing or something like that. You actually want to follow through. And that's the thing that people have the most trouble with is when they start taking the photo, they stop and then the car goes blurry. You want to start taking the photo, keep following through. And normally what I'll do is I'll take the photo and keep following through and moving with the car. So you're really following through on that motion. Uh, the easiest way to do it is by using, uh, normally it's, you get a, an easier time of, of taking these sort of photos by shooting things that are sort of a little bit further away from you. Uh, so I think there was probably, um, if we go back to the photo here, probably about 10, 15 meters distance between me and this car, maybe even 20 meters. Uh, I was quite zoomed in on my lens. Uh, and you're gonna have the, the strongest effect when the subject's directly in front of you. So if you have a look at this car here, the car's moving parallel to me at the moment. I'm pretty much directly side on. If the car's moving towards or away from you, then what happens is you will get a part of the car being sharp, but you might get the front sharp and the background uh, back blurry or the back sharp and the front blurry because the actual distance of the car is changing from you as well while you're panning through that shot. 
All right, so um, that's most of what I want to talk about. Just a couple more general principles for you, and then I'll have a look into some of these questions. Uh, there is a general principle for compensating for your movement as the photographer. Uh, very easy one to remember. And that's to have a shutter speed that's one over your focal length that you're using. Uh, the more zoomed in you are, the quicker shutter speed you need in order to keep things nice and sharp. So I've got my lens here, for example, 24 to 70. Uh, if I was shooting at 24 mil on my focal length, so that's zoomed out, and then I would need a 25th of a second for my shutter speed in order to compensate for any movement. If I was shooting at a 70th of uh, 70 millimeters on my zoom range, which is zoomed in, I need a 70th of a second. Uh, that wouldn't, I don't think cameras actually have a 70th of a second, it'd be an 80th of a second, would be the next closest one I can choose. Now, if you've got good hand-holding technique, uh, you can sort of go a lot slower than what that rule allows. So I actually find in the right circumstances, I can take a photo for about half a second uh, with my hands, regardless of um, anywhere between that sort of 24 to 70 mil range, uh, and still get sharp photos. When you're hand holding the camera, you really want to make sure your elbows are tucked in so they're not flapping around anywhere. You want to make sure you use the viewfinder, and this creates as many points of contact between us and the camera as possible. And the other thing when you're hand holding at really slow shutter speeds is you want to think about your breath too. Because when you breathe in, breathe out, you actually move up and down as well. Uh, the way that I time my photos is I take the photo either at the end of my out breath or after I breathe in. So I'll breathe in, take a photo, breathe out, like that there. And I'm taking a photo at the, at the point where my body is most still. Uh, we also mentioned before, you gotta match the speed of your shutter speed to the speed of your subject. Uh, so if your subject's moving very slowly, the, uh, the relationship between a quick and a slow shutter speed changes to when the, uh, the subject's moving very quickly. Um, just as some sort of rules of thumb, you know, landscapes, I would say anywhere between a sort of uh, a tenth of a second to 30 seconds is a pretty good range. Uh, if you're photographing portraits of people, anywhere between a hundredth of a second to a five hundredth of a second, depending on how quickly they're moving. Uh, and if you're photographing fast moving things like wildlife, anywhere between a five hundredth of a second to a four thousandth of a second. Uh, again, depending on how quickly it's moving. Uh, what I will say though, and I'll reiterate this, it's better to get a, have a quicker shutter speed than a slower one, all right? Uh, and when I'm shooting wildlife in particular, I always choose a shutter speed a little bit quicker than what I need, uh, even if the animal's standing still, because the animal's standing still for this moment, but it could move very quickly the next moment. And I don't wanna be fiddling with my camera settings when that happens. I wanna be ready to catch that motion. Uh, so always err, uh, quicker rather than slower. Uh, we can't fix blurry photos. We need to make sure that we've gotten things nice and sharp. All right, um, so I, I think I've probably answered that uh, shutter speed question with the landscapes there for you, Mel. Um, the package I'm using to show these photos is called Adobe Bridge. Uh, you can download it for free. Uh, this is an ancient version of Adobe Bridge, so it looks quite different now. Uh, but I find it's good just for sort of looking at images and looking at the metadata. So, you know, things like the shutter speed, aperture, ISO, and all those sort of things. Um, and you can do a couple of other useful things with it too, like battery name. Uh, my, my editing suite of choice, though, is, is Lightroom or Photoshop. They're the two ones that I use the most. Um, Let's leave it there. I'm going to give you a couple of exercises to do. Uh, so one exercise would be to put your camera onto shutter priority and change the shutter speed. Keep going slower and slower and slower and find the point where your shutter speed gets too slow for you to be able to handhold and keep that sharp. Uh, and that's good practice. See how slow you can go. Try and beat your record. Um, another little t uh, uh, exercise I'll give you is just to photograph things that are moving at different speeds. So, you know, if you can see some cars from your window or you can safely go out to your street, try photographing some cars at different shutter speeds, both with the panning sort of technique and also keeping the camera still and see how that motion sort of changes with different kinds of shots. Now, uh, we'll leave it there for the week. 
Uh, just want to remind you that we are doing online one-on-ones at the moment. So if you'd like to have a talk with me more specifically about your camera, we're doing them at a special price at $99 an hour. Uh, you can book that in by sending an email to me at school at michaels.com.au. And just want to remind you that the, the store is still open. So 11 till 4 at the moment. You can physically go into the store if you want to, though we encourage you to shop online. And you can give us a call at 9672 2222 and we'll be happy to answer any of your questions. So uh, I'll see you next week. We're gonna start again on Wednesday and we're gonna jump into manual exposure. Make sure you have a good practice with aperture and a good sh practice with shutter speed before then, because we're gonna start to merge all these things together and control everything ourselves. Uh, enjoy the rest of your weekend and I'll see you next time.